small portion, and I am reading it out of the Message Bible tonight. In studying this, I've studied it out of about nine different translations, but I find this one to be the most appropriate, and this is the one that spoke to me. I've got to start the way I started off Saturday and, and this morning, but then we're kicking off on a whole new session of it. So hold on if you've heard the beginning before. But Matthew chapter 5 says, as is wonderful, listen this. And when Jesus saw his ministry was drawing huge crowds, he climbed the hillside or he climbed the mountain side. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed. Everybody shout the committed. I love that word. I love that word, committed. <clears throat> See, I'm, I'm, I'm com is anybody here committed to the Lord, the kingdom of God? I'm committed. I'm not, I'm not half in, half out. Believe you me, I'm, I'm sold out. Uh, those who were apprenticed, that is his disciples, to apprentice to him, the committed, they climbed with him. And arriving in a quiet place, well, Jesus sat down and he taught, listen to these two words, he taught his climbing companions. I love that. I remember many years ago when I first found that scripture, I, I underlined it and then I highlighted it. And when I highlighted, I stood to my feet and I put my hand over my chest like this and I said, that's what I want to be. I have a deep desire to be a climbing partner with you. I want to climb with you. I want to go where you go. I want it that you would climb with me at the same time, a climbing partner. And then, and then the Bible says, this is what he said. Now, let me just put you in the picture. Jesus had just come off a boat. He was on a lake. He had seen miracles out there, probably tired, and he had come in off the, off the shore. When he arrived, there was a huge crowd around there. For whatever reason, he didn't stop to preach to the crowd. He didn't, there's no recorded miracles took place. In fact, he began to walk through the crowd. I can understand when you've been up all night and you've been performing miracles, you get tired. And so whether it was because he was tired and needed to get out of the road, or maybe he had a deep desire to talk to his heavenly father, he pressed through the crowd and the Bible said he began to take a walk up the hillside. He's on a mountainside. He's moving up. He's not looking to see who's coming with him, but he knows there's a bunch of people. Now, let me tell you, not everybody was making the journey. Not everybody left the sandy beach and started to walk up the mountain with him. Some decided we don't need to go there, so they sat where they were. But there is a bunch of people called the committed. And they said, where you go, I will go. We will make the effort. You cannot get up a mountain without an effort. It takes effort to do it. Some people, because they see an effort, I'm not doing that. Say, I can't be annoyed. It's too far for me to go. But let me tell you, there was a people called the committed ones who said, we'll go with you. And they started to climb the mountain with them. And the Bible doesn't tell us how far they went. But I'm certain of this fact that he probably climbed far enough that the crowd down there probably couldn't see or hear what he was about to say. He got up that mountain far enough, then sat down on a rock. And as he turned around, he said, there's a bunch of people with them and he called them his climbing companions. And they made the effort. Let me tell you something, walking with Jesus takes effort. You have to get out of bed early sometimes. Sometimes you gotta go to bed late. I've seen me coming home, driving from Cork, getting into my office at after midnight, one or two in the morning, sitting down on the computer, trying to find out another message for the next morning, a men's meeting or whatever, and falling asleep at the computer, waking myself up and say, where was I? Let me tell you, it takes effort. Everybody shout, effort. But the reason they came, and he came away from the crowd, because understand this, not everybody made the climb, and not everybody was present to hear what he was about to say. Now, what he's about to say, they took it to put it in Scripture, and we called it the Sermon on the Mount. You understand, you know, blessed are the poor, you know all that's. The Sermon of the Mount preached everywhere, taught everywhere. But the day that Jesus Christ taught it, he did not teach it to the public he didn't teach it to the beach people. He didn't teach it to the caravan people. Look at somebody say, get rid of the caravan, get rid of the I'm only keeping you going that. He didn't preach it to the caravanettes. He only preached it to those who made the effort to come up so far with them. And when they were alone, he began to share some stuff that he didn't teach everybody. He didn't teach this to everybody because people wouldn't have believed it if they heard it because he got up and said what we call the Beatitudes. That's not even a good word for it. He began to teach them kingdom thinking. Everybody shout kingdom thinking. 
or the way when you're born again that you should be nigh beginning to think. You can't think like the world thinks. You're not living in the pattern of the world anymore. We got to be living according to the word of God by the instructions of God and led by the Holy Ghost. So he sat down and began to teach them kingdom thinking. He began to talk in a few verses about how they were to be blessed, remain blessed in the midst of adversity. If you don't know these things, then you will never remain blessed in the midst of adversity. You'll lose your joy. You'll lose your peace. You'll get nasty. You'll get grumpy. Look at somebody say, mm -hmm. you become critical. You'll, 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 you'll just get depressed. You'll get discouraged. You'll, you'll say, I'm not going back anymore because you haven't learned the principles. He couldn't teach them to the people on the beach because they didn't want to know. They just want to moan and gripe and complain. But those that went with him, he said, I got secrets to share with you how to stay blessed in the midst of adversity. I chose two of them. And uh, the first one that I did with the women's meeting was really the introduction about the climbing companions. The one I did this morning was a part one of the things he was saying to them. This morning one was about what to do when you're at the end of your rope. Remember that one I taught that this morning? What to do at the end of your rope. This night, tonight one is a different cattle fish altogether. And I'm going to read you the scriptures. Verse three is where we spent this morning. It says, you are blessed. You are blessed when you're at the end of the rope. Now, people would turn around and say, you're nuts. You're crazy. You know what it means to be the end of the rope? It means the doctors give you the worst report you could ever get. It means the bank has foreclosed on you. It means that the injection didn't work. It means the medication's not and void. It simply means she doesn't love you anymore. It means that they're taking the house. You know, anybody know what it's like to be at the end of a rope? We have a proverbial step that says, tie a knot on it so that you don't fall off. That's a load of junk. And people live their life hanging on to the ropes. They smile. They've got makeup on. They've got nice stuff. But in essence, they're hanging on to a rope, hoping that they don't fall off. And I dealt with this this morning. Jesus gave us an illustration and talked to us about how we can remain blessed when you're at the end of of the rope. He says, you're blessed when you're at the end of the rope with less of you and more of God. I'm not going back on that at all because I want to get into this one. He said in verse 4 and I, you are blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then you can be embraced by the one most dear to you. So he, the first thing he talked about is, man, you're blessed. You don't even know it. When you're at the end of the rope, the second is I'm seemingly blessed. I'm blessed when I'm at this place where I've lost that that's dear to me. I know what it's like. Have you ever lost something that's dear to you? Something that's precious to you? I, I, I know I'm talking to you. I, 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 know I'm, I know I hear it in your heart. I hear your heartbeat from here. But you know what it's like. And he had a message for you. And he said, you are blessed if you allow these things to turn you towards the master. If you allow those things to push you towards God. Those things are there to turn you away from God. But if you want to remain blessed, get back on track with God real quick. Get closer to him because he's closer to you now than you could ever imagine or ever thought you would ever be. He's a hair's breadth away from you. He's watching out for you. He's taking care of you as long as you're turning towards him. And let me add something else to it. Turning towards him because I know many who do turn towards him, but there's something missing. They turn towards him, but they've got a very low expectation. They turn to him and said, Dear God, I'll probably die in the midst of you. I just want to know I love you anyway. He said, That's not the way to remain blessed. He, people do turn, but they turn with a very low expectation. And even when they turn to him, they really never expect God to do anything apart from rescue them. They don't expect ever to be coming out of it. They don't expect to be better. They, they really don't expect God. And he said, if you want to be blessed, you've got to turn to me and you've got to learn how to increase your faith and learn how to expect me to do something dynamic in your life. See, this is why the story of the prodigal sons are, you've got to understand the, the workings of this parable. But he talked about a, a, a guy, that called, we call it the prodigal son. Let me tell you something. The kid left home. Didn't you read it? He left home. And he took the whole show with him. 
He, he wasn't running off with two five pound notes in his hip pocket and, and a blank check. I mean, the daddy had a whole bunch of stuff and he split it between the sons. He has a heap of finance. This guy has got a bank full of money, but he hasn't the sense when he got it. You know what? The boy's gone. And it's not too long after that, he blows all the wealth. He didn't tell you. I can tell you. Somebody said, oh, I've had a million. A million wouldn't last you two years maximum, and you'd be through it. People, people, people would be through the million in one year. You would be surprised if you ever counted up how much you earned, what was given. And if you ever counted up, you would be surprised how much money's been in your hands in your lifetime. You would absolutely be surprised. But here he is. He's gone. Took the money and went and blew it. And now he's not doing well. Now he's in a predicament because his life's not turning out the way he thought it would turn out. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you were young and crazy, Jimmy? Absolutely. And, and, and life didn't turn out the way you proposed. You thought, man, if I had money, I could go be, do, do. But you know what? It didn't work that way. And it didn't work that way from him. And eventually, it doesn't take too long, but now he's working in a pig farm. It's not bad for a Jewish boy. He's working in a pig farm. He's in such a state that even the pigs are eating better food than him till one day he finds himself reaching into the pocket, into the bucket and sharing some of the food that the pigs was eating just to stay alive. And one day doing it, he looked at the pigs and he looked at himself. And the Bible, King James had put it this way, he came to himself. In other words, he wised up. He came to his senses and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I was, I was better off at Daddy's house. I was far better off when I was back there. You know what he said to himself? He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to go back home. I, I, I know, I, know I, I took everything, and I know I've lost it. I've lost everything. I've got nothing. And, and, and I don't even know what Daddy will say because I blew his, his inheritance. But you know something? I'm going to go back because anything's better than living here. Even the servants back home is living a better life than me. So, so he said, I'm going to go back home. But he lost everything. He had nothing to show. He had not a dime, nothing left. And now because he had everything, his thinking has changed. Oh, he's running back to daddy now. But he's coming back with a very, very low expectation because now he's beginning to say things to himself. And we can begin, the Bible records his thoughts, which will help us, because he's thinking and he's saying some stuff. He says, you know, I'm going to go back. But I tell you what, I, I, I'm not going back. It would be silly of me to ask, but I'm not even going to go back as a son. Look, I'll just go back as a servant. That's wrong thinking. Look at somebody say, that's wrong thinking. He's now beginning to lower his expectation. He's now got a strategy. He's got a plan. His plan is to go back. But let me tell you, his strategy for his future is now based on negative thinking. He has based his future on negative, negative thinking. And let me tell you, if he was going back like that, and if his daddy accepted that contract, said, okay, you're no longer a son, you're my servant, let me tell you, he would not have been much better at home than he was when he was in the pig farm. Are you with me? So this is the way we deal with God. We're coming, oh God, I don't know how you'll ever forgive me. Well, he does. I don't know if you'll ever accept me. Well, he does. Look at somebody say, he loves you. He loves you. He said, I, I, I tell you, I, I'm not going back as a, I'm not going back, I'll just go back as a servant. Why go back as a servant when you're a son? It's crazy. But it's thinking. And here's what he's thinking. I'll probably go back home now. Daddy probably give me a lecture. Isn't this what daddies do? Daddy, he'll give me a lecture, but you know something? I deserve it. I, I, I'll have to humble myself. You know something? I won't, even, I won't even ask him, can I sleep in the house anymore? You know what I do? I'll, I'll, I'll sleep in the bunk in the barn. Uh, you know something? No matter what he asks me to do, I, I'll, I'll get the pitchfork out and I'll bring the hay in. I'll, I'll grouse the yard. I'll, I'll water the... I'll, just, I'll be like a servant. I'll just work all over the place. Whatever he wants me to do, I'll, I'll just do it because anything's better than living here. So he has dropped his expectations of what he used to have at home, but at least he's heading in the right direction. And, but let me tell you, there's a word in there that says, but God. Everybody shout, but God. Oh, I love him. I want to tell you, he's merciful. We 
never get what we deserve. There's a thing called the grace of Almighty God. I think we wallow in it. I think we swim in it and we do not understand it. It forgives you in a second of time. It doesn't throw you in a pig pen. It lifts you right out of the pig pen and say, come on ahead, son. I've been waiting on you coming back to daddy. He came back with a low expectation. He was not expecting anything. This is where most believers, the, the people on the beach, this is what they believe. I'm coming back, but I've really got no expectations about coming back. I'm back as a servant and not as a son. When he got round the final bend of that road on his way home, and suddenly for the first time in a long time, looked down the lane and could see the daddy's house, he was not expecting his daddy to be standing there, looking in his direction. He was not expecting his daddy to be standing there looking for him. He was not expecting his daddy to be excited about him coming home. He was not expecting his daddy to run from the porch and hug that man and cry on his shoulder. He did not expect his daddy to call, make phone calls to the neighbors and his friends and saying, we need to come gather at my house for a barbecue. We need to celebrate because my son was lost, but my son has now come home. He did not expect his father to kill a calf, to bring out a robe, to put a ring on his finger and to have a party. Let me help you here. Sin will steal your expectation. Sin will steal your expectation of God being a good God and a merciful God. That's why you can't get into sin. It will begin to deteriorate your whole thinking in the inside. Let me tell you something. Disappointments. Disappointments will not only dampen your spirit, it will take your joy in a second of time and it will steal your hope one piece at a time. Disappointments come in different shapes and different forms. When you start to allow disappointment on the inside of you, let me tell you something, one piece at a time, it starts to take your joy. The joy is usually the first to go, by the way. You can't smile anymore. You don't say nice things anymore. It steals from you one piece at a time. It takes your joy. Your spirit man is down, but you're not up here anymore walking around. No, your head's down and your, long, your arms are longer than your knees when you're walking because discouragement has doing a work on the inside of you and your expectations are becoming lower and lower and lower till one day you begin to believe God mustn't love me at all. What's the sense in even going back to church? What's the sense? In, you know, so if he did take me back, I'll just be a servant. I can't qualify as a son anymore. That's called wrong thinking. And wrong thinking will kill your dream. Wrong thinking will cause you to settle for second best. Most people settle for second best. I'll just get through, but he'll probably be never asked me to go again. They'll settle for second best, and they'll find them living beneath the level of a child of the living God. Look at somebody say, I'm a child of God and not a servant. I like the passage of scripture when David was up against one of the most horrific times in his life. The men around him and he rode into his village after fighting the enemy, after doing God's work and they came back home and while they were away, the enemy had come in and stole the wives, stole the, stole the children, stole the cattle, stole everything and he came back and his closest buddies to him began to lift up stones and the Bible said they were going to stone him to death. They are totally disappointment. They have lost the vision. They had lost respect for the man who had given them everything. When he got them, there were no bodies. All of a sudden, they were riding high on horses and having money and wealth and prestige and fame, and, 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 and they were renowned across the kingdom. All of a sudden, because of disappointment, all of a sudden, they forgot all that type of stuff. And David, the Bible tells you, David got, and he, he, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 8, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, he didn't turn around and say, God, will you just get me out of this? I tell, like, even, even if they're just talking, I'll probably lose half of them, but like, if I could keep a handful of them just to protect me, I'll be happy enough. That's settling for second best. He did not say that. Here's his request. God, shall I chase after that enemy? Shall I pursue after the troop? And shall I overtake them? And God answered him, I love this. Pursue, everybody shout, pursue. 
pursue for you will surely overtake them. And listen to this, and without fail, you will recover all. Everybody shout all. all. Not just a little bit, not settle just, well, I hope they don't stone me. Yet. God, if you get me out of this stone, I'll be happy. No, no, he's not even talking stoning. He's not even talking about what they're doing. He's all the way on the next mission. He said, my, this is tight going. But if I get on my horse, will you get me out there? And God says, get on your horse, son, and go and recover all. There's people in this building and you need a word from God. And I've just given it to you. If you will pursue, you will overtake and you will recover all. I'm here to tell you, get rid of low expectations. If I just get out of this, I'll be okay. If God will just give me enough food to keep me going for the week, I'll be fine. I don't even need another holiday, God. And I don't have to change the car. And, 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 and if the kids would just come and talk to me once a week, they don't even have to love me. Quit it! Stop it! There is low level expectation and with that you will get nowhere. You're a beach dweller. The man and woman that says, I'm going with you, when he got them up and said, sit down, I need to talk to you. If you want to remain blessed, you have got to learn how to pursue. You have got to learn how to overtake and you've got to learn to have a high expectation and recover all. Look at somebody say, I'm going to recover it all. I'm after it, I'm going. Man, the devil had me sick and I couldn't get out of bed. But you see, now I'm up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make time. I'm going to captivate. I'm going to go. Everybody shout, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. The devil stole this, but I'm telling you now that I'm back on my feet, I'll never be bankrupt again. I'm going after this with a vengeance. I'll take everything I can get. My, I'm not a low-level Christian. I have a very high expectation of Almighty God. Most people I know do not have that because they're beach Christians. They have never read the Beatitudes the way God meant it to be. He didn't talk to everybody. He talked to the ones that wanted to get somewhere in life. It takes effort to press. It takes effort to go through. But when you leave the base camp and you start to head up, get this in your thinking. I'm not walking here as a servant. I'm walking here as a son. I'm in the tracks of the royal king here. He, he, I'm going here because he wants me to be with him. He wants me to be a climbing companion. I can hardly wait to sit down till he tells me some more. And he'll talk to you not as a low-level servant. He'll talk to you like you're the child of the living God. He'll welcome you and say, I'm on your side. I'm going to do something for you. You got to have a high expectation when you're going to walk with God. When you have that, let me put it this way, your worst day will become your best day because it's driven you back to God. And when you get with God, he'll say things to you that, that it could go, if, if you were a beach person, you wouldn't hear it because God will whisper in your ear and say, all right, we're going to get it. All right, we're making tracks. All right, doors are opening. You won't hear that if you're crying. You won't hear that if you're, I just, just the doubt God. Get, oh, you won't hear it. It'll bypass you like it was never said. You have got to, to have an expectation that God will meet you in the place he said he was. What has he promised you? What has he brought you through? Quit complaining about how long it takes to get there. Just be glad you're on the track. Just be glad you've still got breath in your body and up and moving. You have something to pursue. I run, I run around with people who has nothing to pursue. Give up years ago. Don't know if they're coming or going, walking in circles and going nowhere. I like getting in with people who's got vision, who's got focus. When we, Harold Presley was here, I wanted him to talk for a while about another guy, that, uh, Bob Keough, because Bob Keough's in, in his 80s. But let me tell you something, that man has high energy, but he's got places to go and people to see. And when you hear stories about men like that, man, it stretches your gizzard. It makes you want to get up and go with him. You're looking at his phone number. You don't want to sleep in the same tent, but at least you want to go. <laughs> oh my goodness high energy I know you can hit a mess I know it man what would life be if we didn't hit the problems I told you this morning if you don't have a problem then you've been written off the book for miracles you can only the only thing common about the miracles in the Old Testament and New Testament just one thing in common is this that all began with a problem and if you don't have a problem if you don't have a problem then you're not on the list for a miracle a pity that people has no problems. Look at somebody say, have you no problems? I said this this morning, I'm going to have a prayer line for people. Not that's in problems, because you're going to get a miracle. Look at somebody say, we're going to get a miracle. 
I need to have a prayer line for people with no problems. Because if you're in no problems, you're in a pitiful place because you're not on the miracle list. He took you off the list. You don't need a miracle. Everything's okay with you. <laughs> but I'm high on the list. I'm high on the list because I got places to go and people to see. You got to dream the dreams. You got to keep going. And, and let me tell you something. God's not angry with you. He's not angry with you. Jesus took the punishment at Calvary so that God never in your lifetime would be angry with you. That he would always be there to welcome you. That any time you would say, let me be your claiming partner, he would say, there's room enough. Come on, get up here. We'll get off that beach. Get out of that caravan. Let just <laughs> he loves people that's at the end of the rope. The end of the rope is not a bad place to be as long as you know what you're doing. As long as you know what you're doing. It's, it, let me tell you something. It's not the things that happen to you that destroy you. It's how you respond to it that will kill you stone dead. It's how you respond to it. Learn what the master says. And he said in this particular place, he says, I'm talking to those that's lost everything. Lost everything. I'm talking to those that's lost those that's closest to you. On the journey on the mount to be a climbing companion with the master, I, I've had to bury one or two on the way up. I've lost some close people. I've lost them up there. So have you. I could have sat down and any one of them just pulled up a chair and said, this will do me now. But somehow or another, I knew there was more places to climb and I wasn't at the top yet. So you've got to move on. And he's talking tonight to people that lost everything. And he said, when you lost everything, don't lose your expectation. Don't lose your expectation. Increase your expectation. When you're broken, and we tell you someone, to come to Jesus Christ for salvation alone, you had to be broken. Salvation. You, you lead people through to Jesus Christ, they usually stand with tears running down their face and saying, dear God, I'm sorry. There's a brokenness that takes place on the inside. I prophesy to people. I watch tears run down their face. I watch a brokenness taking place because in their brokenness, God becomes real. God's never closer to you than at that moment when your world has fell apart, when you've lost everything and you're broken. He just says, but what the connection is from your side, the connection is called high expectation. It says, Don't come back to me as a servant. Keep running to me as a son. Don't sit down there and say nothing's ever going to happen or if you can just get me out of this. No, begin to declare what you really need, where you're going and how you're going to do it and get your expectation. Get your flag flying, dream the dreams and keep talking about it. Keep pressing, keep pushing, keep going, keep doing with a full expectation. Then your worst day will be your best day because that problem drove you right into the face of God. And I am convinced that God is going to do something tremendous. I prayed for people this morning for miracle breakthroughs. I'm going to pray the same the night again. I'm going to pray that God does something to put your expectation back up. He has ways and means of meeting you right there. I mean, the, the hardest bit is if you've just got a knock, if you've just, if you've just got a disappointment, if you've just come through something that, that knocked the heart out of you, took the breath out of you. I know for a moment or two, when the breath's out of you, there's an evil one who's reaching in for your dreams and for your hopes and your joy. And, and if you don't recover real quick, he'll snatch that. He'll take that right out of you. He'll take it right out. And man, you'll struggle for years just to get that back in, get, to get that back in. And at the end of the day, you'll probably settle for just give me a little joy. Help me not to cry anymore. But you'll never pursue what God has asked you to do. So don't let him steal it. Don't let the devil take it. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. For sure we're going to have it. If you haven't had it yet, well, you're probably then Adam's age. He doesn't have trouble at his age. He's got teeth, but he doesn't have trouble at his age. He's got a mama. So when troubles come, mama steps up and say, who do you think you are? Absolutely. <laughs> but let me tell you, we'll always have trouble, tribulation. It's how you handle it. And I'm telling you tonight what Jesus said. Pulled him to one side and said, listen, son. He said, you'll find yourself at the end of the rope. But just look at me. He said, it's times you'll find when you lose things, you may lose it all. He says, but under no condition ever lose your expectation because I'll take you right back. The boy came back home. And I thought about it when I was putting it together, writing it and thinking it through. And I thought to myself, you know, let's just change the scenario around. Saying he never said to himself, 
I'd just be a servant. Uh, I'd love not to be. Sandy never went through that scenario. What if he just turned around and said, you know something? My dad's a good man. <laughs> He's probably from Belfast. <laughs> my dad, my dad's a good man. All right. So, so he turned around and said, said you know, so my daddy's a gentleman. And all right, I, I blew the whole thing. But you know, my dad's okay. Look at somebody say, my dad's okay. You said, my dad'll be all right. He might hit my bit for the chin, but he'll hug me after that. And if he had just hopped over the fence and went, dee, dee, da, dee, dee, and headed on back home with a smile on his face, saying, well, I'm, I'm still his son, and got up through the gate and the daddy had hugged, you know, the, the daddy was coming to hug him anyway. The daddy still had the fatted calf and the daddy still would have called the ring and the daddy still would have put the, the thing back on saddle and the daddy would have said to him, you don't have to sleep in the barn, son, you're my child. You don't have to drive the tractor, you can drive the jag. But I thought about that. That's right. It was the son who put this whole scenario in his head. That's in there in the father's house. If the man, if his son had to come back with one leg, if the son, as long as he came back, God is willing to pile everything by him, it was the thinking of the boy that was making him go back home like a pauper. You are not expected to come to the throne room of God like a pauper. You were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The precious blood of Jesus Christ paid for you once and once only. You are precious goods. You are invaluable. Hell does not have the money to buy you back. There's no resources in hell to buy you back from the Father. You're not for sale. Look at somebody say, you're not for sale. The reason you're not for sale is because you are a child of the living God. You've been adopted into the family of God. You're not for sale. You will never be a servant. If you're a servant, it's because you choose to be. I want to serve you. You died for me. Let me serve you. But you'll never serve as a servant. You'll always serve as a son. Are you with me? And the only reason that was to let you know there's a, this wasn't God's thinking that you're a nobody, get into the barn, you're a nobody. Look, you blew the whole kid back. No, that was never God's thinking. The Bible put that story in to let you know, here's the thoughts of the father. As long as he comes back home, I'm happy. <coughs> as long as he ever can get him to come back, I can put him back on track. The daddy never said, how did you spend the money, son? The daddy never said, do you need a loan? The daddy never brought it up as far as that scripture. I, if he had it, it would have written there. The daddy never ma- brought the mess up. He just said, I am so glad you're back. Now we can get back on track. Are you with me? There's no better day for your heavenly father than the day you're swinging the rope. And instead of tying a knot, get the thing going and swing right over into the camp of God. There's no better day for God then you walk in and say, I have had a tough day. I have been through hell and high water. They have taken the money. They have, t- they have stole the dog. The sheep aren't milking anymore. But <laughs> and you go for, and the father turns around and said, your son, I'm just glad you came. And sit, pull over here and sit down. I'll walk with you and I'll talk with you. Just sit with me a while. You don't have to do anything to perform for God. You just have to be there and smile with them. You've got to be a climbing companion. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Don't let him steal your world. Don't let him reduce you to a servant when you're a child of the living God. Did you get it? Did you get it? He couldn't t- talk that to the beach people. He had to get those, the committed ones, the ones who would come apart. They'd suddenly realize, that's right, because the people on the beach don't realize who God is. They don't realize who God is. God is such a loving God. He's so merciful. He's holding nothing back. He's working things. He's working things out on your behalf. Are you with me? Father, tonight there's people in this building and they have tied knots after knots on that rope of life. They've come to the end of the knot many, many a time. But we, we realize now that it's not the rope we're hanging on to, but it's Jesus has a hold of us. We realize when we've lost everything, that we've really lost nothing because at the end of the day, we got that closeness right with you. You have it all sewn up. You have it together for us. You're watching over us. Of course, we're hurting, and of course, there's natural emotions. We understand that. 
but we haven't lost pace and we haven't lost step and we haven't lost a moment. But there's people in this building and they're struggling because their expectation has been daunted. The, the enemies used it as a target till, till they feel so diminished, they, the, the dream is gone. The, the expectation has been so reduced. Tonight, this meeting will be to restore the expectation of the people of God tonight. I know, I know the Bible gives us steps that we can do to restore things. I understand the steps. But Holy Spirit, there's times you just give us a kickstart. And there's times you reach in. And there's times you do things that can't normally be done. That's why we're here. If we wanted the deep theology, we would have wanted somewhere else. We came for the work of the Holy Spirit to finish what he started. And you said that, they, that they, when we have started the good work, you would see it through to the end. My Father, there's some people that there's, we've climbed till we're tired climbing. So we need, we need a boost. And we need it this night. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to ask you today, if that's you, if I need to pray for you for your expectation to be raised to another level, then, then. TV, is your, is your uh, taxi here? Yeah. All right. Put your hands in him real quick before he goes out that door because I missed you the last time. We, we, we have got an expectation for you, David, that, that the things that you shared with me beforehand will be accomplished in your body, in your life, in your arena, in Jesus' name. And also for your daddy, that those things that you shared with me will, will begin to diminish and fade out and not be as even the doctor prescribed. But we will see health and healing uh, restored back to you and to your father. We believe that now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, for the rest of us, I'll take a moment or two, lay hands on anybody that needs laid hands. If you don't, it's warm and we can go home or we can drink coffee. Okay, all right. I see you're all excited. If there's anybody and you want me, I, I'm just going to pray for your expectation level to be listened. God knows how to do it. You can have a dream, a vision. You can read a book. You can look at a sentence. You can hear a scripture. And there's a million different ways God can suddenly boost your expectation. It's not a crime to stand here. It's biblical.